again the Canadian Army overseas goes over the top in its victory loan campaign. As the seventh loan hits the home stretch, old man inflation is put to rout in a decisive fashion. The objective of eight million dollars is passed. With some outlying offices still to be heard from, the goal is exceeded by 103 percent. Not only on Belgian battlefronts, but in United Kingdom hospitals, the boys sign on the dotted line. Canadian service women also go all out in saving for the nation's future security. Down the lines of communication in the Italian theater of operations, familiar posters make good suggestions as to what to do with surplus lira. At Riccione, the Heeland laddies pipe the investors to the pay bloke's office. They buy bonds by the thousands. Two Canadian VCs subscribe to the drive. Major Mayonnaise invests in victory, and Major Paul Criquet gets into the swim. All arms add their dollars to their bullets to forge and tighten the chain which is throttling the life out of Hitler. Canada's High Commissioner, the Honorable Vincent Massey, accompanied by the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, arrived to open the Meet Canada exhibition in the Scottish capital. Scotland, always favored by Canadian forces on leave, plays host once again to Canada's sons and daughters. Sir William Darling, Lord Provost of Edinburgh, extends a welcome during the opening ceremonies, and Mr. Vincent Massey officially declares the exhibition open. The Meet Canada exhibition is designed to show the life and work of Canada and its people. The Dominion's contribution to the common war effort is delineated in graphic style. A guard of honor from the Royal Canadian Navy takes post in front of the Royal Scottish Museum, seen at the exhibition, which forges another bond in cordial inter-empire relationships. Shortly after D-Day, Douglas Dakotas have kept up a shuttle service to evacuate wounded from the front lines to United Kingdom base hospitals. New blood banks are carried on their return journeys to the battlefront. Many lives are saved in forward areas by prompt transfusions made possible by fast transport of plasma to RAPs. Ambulances meet the transport on the landing strip and vital medical supplies are transferred for the trip up to front line medical posts. On the return journey, ambulances carry wounded from casualty clearing stations where they have received treatment to make them comfortable for the trip across the channel. A journey in the flying hospital is a far less trying experience for the more serious cases than the rough trip on a landing craft across the channel. Every inch of the way, the medical staff is able to attend to the every need of the wounded lads. Blood transfusions are administered as the winged agents of mercy speed toward Blighty. side of the channel, convoys of ambulances arrive on the dock to meet the plane. Girls of the Canadian Red Cross Corps drive the lorry. Planes carrying as many as 27 patients at a time are rapidly unloaded. The last lap of the journey takes the lads to comfortable base hospitals in the south of England. Casualties recuperate to fight another day. As the tide of battle surges northward in Italy, the big problem of Allied military government officials is to rehabilitate the thousands of refugees. The situation is especially acute where the advance has been rapid in densely populated areas. There are several types of refugees. There is the type who work their way south through enemy lines. There is the type who is taken over with liberated areas. And there is the group who work their way up from the south when their homes have been freed. All present the same problem. Food, clothing, and medical care must be supplied, and housing of some type must be provided until they can rebuild their own devastated homes. Carrying their few remaining goods and chattels, 
They are rounded up in lorries and brought to a central transit center. In one refugee camp alone, 55,000 have had to be dealt with and as many as 7,000 fed in one day. Red Cross workers do yeoman duty in guiding the little streams of the endless river of humanity which flows back in the wake of war. Improvised clinics deal with everything from tummy aches to flea bites. Civil affairs officers who work in connection with AMGOT have a real job on their hands. They must interview the many refugees. They must decide which are resident and which must be evacuated to other areas. Then there are the thousand and one disputes between the Italians themselves which must be settled. Sometimes the problems are ones to try even the shrewdness of a barrack room lawyer. Civil labor offices are operated by a branch of British engineers. They register and offer work to those civilians who have been rehabilitated. Women are given homey tasks and they fall too with a zest. Laborers are paid 50 lira a day and a ration of flour. Thus the machinery commences to function which will build a new Italy from the rubble and ruin of a liberated nation. Seaborne landing in the rear of enemy troops on the Dutch mainland, Canadian carriers race to smash the Skelt pocket. Advancing through flooded areas, battered Breskins is overrun. The backdoor assault loosens up German defenses. A veteran Canadian brigade jars Jerry loose from his toehold in the vital territory. To a Canadian Highland regiment goes the task of cleaning out the important strong point of Breskins. They attack with such gusto that hardly a stone is left unturned in the annihilated town. Hardly is the smoke of battle cleared when the once picturesque beer bleak landscape starts to shake itself free from the ruins. Soon grist will come to the mill. Busy hands repair ruined homes. Happy peasants, free from oppression, go their way in a new found peace. Across the Skelt, armored Skelt cars are the vanguard of advance, west across the South Beveland Peninsula. Continuously harrying the stubbornly fighting enemy, valuable ground is gained in the race to free the approaches to the great harbor of Antwerp. Field regiments of artillery maneuver in close support of armor and infantry, providing the blasting power to keep Jerry on the move. bank of the Skelt, other elements of the 1st Canadian Army prepare for an amphibious attack on the Babylon Peninsula and its German strongholds on the north bank of the estuary. American-made alligators, the last word in amphibious transport, take our troops to the attack covered by naval and air support. the battle for the Skelt moved into its final phase. Once cleared and when the first freighter sailed into Antwerp, 
men of the 1st Canadian Army will have attained the most important objective since D-Day. German admission states that with the great port available to the Allies, a death blow could be delivered to Berlin. So the attack continues, removing the enemy finger from the dike to allow the Allied flood to surge forward to the right.